Hello. Welcome to today's episode of Suzanne Off the Cuff with my special guest, Cheryl Brunette. And I'm very excited to have her here with me today because she's one of the people that I rely on to get accurate information, not only from her book, which I'll show you in a few minutes, but from her videos. And it's been so fun actually talking with her. I just love it. So the way I met, uh, found out about Cheryl to begin with was when I was working on the Master Hand Knitting program and I was trying to learn more about sweater construction. And I, w was, I didn't want to learn how to read a pattern. I wanted to learn how do I make a, a sweater from scratch, my own sweater from scratch. And so I did a lot of research on that and her book, Sweater 101, was one of the references that I used. And I actually really like this book because she breaks it down into a very doable system. And when you're first trying to learn how to knit a sweater from scratch, it's kind of like jumping into the ocean. You feel like there's just so much out there that you don't even know, you don't know where to begin. And she breaks it down into a very doable system of creating a sweater from scratch. So that was my first introduction to her. And then later on, I started seeing some of her YouTube videos. And her, the way, her manner of teaching is really nice. I like it. She's very calm. And when you listen to her and watch her videos, she gives you, she exudes into you, into the viewer, the confidence that they can execute that. She's very calm and she does it slow enough that you can see it. And there's not a lot of chit-chatting stuff going on, which I... When I'm looking for a technique, I want to go and watch a video. I want to see the person do that technique and explain to me why and wherefore about that technique. And she does that. So uh, she was, of course, on my list of possible interviewees, and she accepted. And so she, here she is today. So welcome, Cheryl. Nice to see you. Thank you. It's nice to see you, too, Suzanne. And thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, you're was welcome. Really gracious of you. And it's fun. We've been connecting a little bit to get ready for now, and it's been a lot of fun. It has been fun. So I want to welcome a bunch of people that are on here first, and then we'll shoot over to you, and uh, I'll ask you my, my first question. So we've got Elena Mazuka from California, Elizabeth Nissan from Sweden, Nelson, I'm sorry, Mary Inman from Georgia, Wanna be artiste, artist, that's good. Karen from Colorado. Knitting Baker from Middle Tennessee. Fatima from Portugal. Sharon Decker from Northern Illinois. Francoise from France. Duke of Nico from Memphis. Uh, Carol Brasino from New York City. Champ Smith from New York City. Bakken Knitting from Belgium. Tiffany from Sydney, Australia. Kathy Leonard from Virginia, Rita Graham from Vancouver, Nut and Pearl, I love that, from Columbia, Canada, Dolise from Washington, Jane Hart from Arkansas, Rona Shane from Southern California, Kimmy Nutt from Croydon, Emily Beaton from Pennsylvania, Tre uh, Trevster from um, Valencia, Spain, and more. So welcome everybody. I think you're going to get a real, uh, a lot of information out of this uh, live stream today. So Cheryl, I'm going to ask you the same question that I ask everybody. And that is, how did you come to knitting to begin with? Well, um, if you read my biography, it said that I started knitting at age seven because it was safer than embroidery. But actually, I only started knitting seriously at age seven. I had started much earlier, probably at four or five. But my grandmother was from Hungary, and my mother was their firstborn. Um, they didn't even speak English when she was born. And the tradition back then was to train all of your girls in every kind of fiber art. I mean, my grandmother... When the kids were little, she would take out the Sears catalog and give it to them and say, okay, what kind of sleeve do you want? 
what kind of skirt do you want? And so she would take those pictures and make up a pattern and sew their clothes. She crocheted. I have a crocheted bedspread of hers. I wish um, I'd gotten it out and embroidered. Those were her favorite things. But my mother was the knitter. But I had to learn all those things. It wasn't until I got polio when I was seven, 1954, the last major epidemic in Detroit. Um, and the vaccine was available in May of 55. I went, I had just started school. I went into the hospital for a few weeks. It's a very fast virus. It rips through your system and does its damage um, quickly. And I didn't suffer enough damage to stay in the hospital. I was able to come home and my parents were the best con artists in the world because the, I did um, suffer some motor neuron death. So I was pretty weak, but they had me riding a bicycle. You know, I had all this physical therapy every single day, some of it formal, some of it, a lot of it informal. And especially as a child, that's exhausting. Um, and I was out of school for a while. I didn't go back to school, I don't think, until like Thanksgiving-ish. And um, so I would, and you have to rest your body as you're rebuilding your muscles. So then I would go to bed. So my biography says that I, it was safer than embroidery. Well, sometimes I would fall asleep. And so if I dropped an embroidery needle, it was a lot more dangerous than if I just dropped knitting needles. And my mother was an absolute expert knitter. So I learned both to knit really well and to read really well because my best friend's dad was a fire inspector for the city of Detroit. And back then they used to, if you didn't sell a magazine or a comic book, you ripped off the top and you sent it back to the publisher and you got credit for it. So he would go around to these newsstands and collect all these coverless comic books. So I had a stack of comic books that thick. And when you have the pictures and the words, then you can learn a lot of words. Plus, my mom was there. And so so that's how I started. And I really haven't stopped much since. Um, by the time I was in high school, I made there was a, a girl in our school who wanted angora sweaters and I three of them they were pastel pink pastel blue and white and so I knit those for pay <clears throat> that was my I was about 14 when that was my first paying gig and I was telling this story of years ago when I knit those sweaters angora back then and even now you know, things fly all over. And so I was teaching a class back when we had, I had my knitting school in our Victorian house over there, or my, uh, my, my son's family's Victorian house. And it was a Sunday afternoon. We were in the parlor. The sun was coming in. You could see the dust motes. And one of the women had some Angora. We were learning two-fisted Fair Isle. And you could see these little pieces of angora floating around. And so I said, oh, yeah, when I was a kid, I had to knit these three angora sweaters. And I knit them in a pillowcase. At which point, one of the women looked absolutely stricken. She stopped knitting and looked up and she said, did you cut holes for your eyes? She thought that I was in the pillowcase and not the sweater. <laughs> vision of what came up. So, okay, so back. So I was fifteen, and then I went off to, um, as any teacher will tell you, if you have someone sitting next to you one on one, and you run into a problem, and that person can get you past that problem right there, right then you can advance to mastery so much faster than any other time. And so I knit, it was not popular when I was in high school, which was the early 1960s, to knit. But I knit like crazy and I was in plays and I never really had a, the, you know, the lead part. So 
I would be sitting in the auditorium a lot and I knit stockings. That's the other thing. I was raised just outside of Detroit. And so I knit the kinds of stockings out of wool that you use with garter belts. That was to keep my legs warm because we couldn't wear pants to school. And um, I wore leggings because of the polio all the way through middle school. And I was not going to wear leggings to walk to high school. So these stockings really helped. So I was, and I taught friends, a couple of friends asked if they could learn. So I did that. And then I went off to college and I even knit sometimes when I was in college and then moved to Germany um, after I graduated and did a little bit of teaching here. And then I, my first husband was in the army because it was 1968 that we graduated from college. So everyone was being drafted and we were very fortunate and lived in a tiny little village on the French border. We were the only Americans there out of 600 people. And so then I got to play with German yarns. And of course I knit over there. I also taught at the department of defense school there, the, the middle school. Then we came back to the States, went to Korea. I, that was like one of the few places in my life I didn't knit because I only lived there eight months and I lived in by myself in an apartment in Seoul and just stay at the time. It was a very, it was a third world country. So just adjusting to that. And again, I taught in the middle school at, um, in downtown or at the base in Seoul. So I knit off and on, but it wasn't until I moved out West 40 years ago and I um, met a man out here that whom I married and I find I, at 35, I finally had my first child. I never knew that I wanted a child, but when it hit, <laughs> I wanted him. And um, I stay, I wanted to stay close to him and home while he was growing up. 19, he was born in 82. In January of 1984, my mother, who had moved to Florida, died. Um, so my brothers who lived in Detroit went down and sister-in-law went down and took care of anything. Because I was stuck. You know, I had this very active and still active. He was 13 months old at the time. And um, so I inherited a huge box of yarn that my sister-in-law sent up to me and also a little bit of money. And because I had a lot, I collected yarn over the years. When that came, I thought, how am I ever going to knit my way through this? And I had read about the Bond knitting frame and I'd never been interested in a knitting machine before. So this is 1984. Um, And I took the, money and I bought myself one because you could use hand knitting yarns right thought that's great until but when you have the kind of active kid I had it sat in the box it came and it sat in the box for at least two months until a friend came over and said have you opened that thing yet and I said no she said I'm taking him to the beach <laughs> thank you <laughs> you've got two hours go ahead and do it so I opened it up and I started playing with it and even though, you know, I was a high school English teacher, that's really my profession, sort of. Um, I, my aptitude in high school was for mechanical engineering. And when I started to play with that machine and I ran it across with some worsted weight yarn and suddenly I had these rows of knitting, I became absolutely fascinated. So Because I was such a highly skilled and experienced hand knitter, I did lace. I did, I did intarsia. I, you know, I had done everything. I mean, when you're making lace long stockings that come up to your garter belt and what another pair, they were, um, they were cables all the way around and all how I made them is instead of increasing, I just increased the needle size all the way up. So, and these weren't from patterns, they were just from sock patterns. And then I designed them so they would go all the way up my thighs. So I, I started experimenting with techniques that I could do by hand, but to do them on the machine by hand manipulating. And then 
there was a little educational, um, like a, just a pamphlet. And it, the woman who published it was in Portland, Oregon. So I started sending her hints. Look, you can do this or you can do that. This is how you can modify it. And um, I was just having a ball with the modifications of C-clamps and sticks and, you know, silly things. But they worked. And so she invited me down maybe the next year to assist at a major workshop for her. Wow. So then I ended up writing um, articles that it turned into a magazine. Finally, I wrote articles for it for years and, and they were mostly, even though they were machine knitting articles, it was in the context of this is the fabric that you're making. Mm-hmm. This is the technique, but you, I mean, you can make, you make the same fabric right. when you're with two sticks. Right. So my mother had died in 84 at the beginning of the year. And my father-in-law died at 84 at the end of the year. And the Victorian house that has been in my son's family for five, he's fifth generation, was empty. That's where my father-in-law would come up in the summers. He was down in Southern California in the winters. And so we have this extra house. And what are we going to do with it? So, well, I could do a knitting school. So I started, actually, it was the first, at first it was the Artisan Center. A friend of mine was a great toll painter. So she and I opened the Maristone Artisan Center together. <laughs> but that only went on for a couple of seasons. And then I had a knitting school there. And because my articles had been published all over the country, and the machine was quite popular at that time, the bond, it was the original, and it was well made. Um, I had, when I, my exchange for the, um, for writing the articles was that they would advertise, because they didn't have a budget to pay me, they advertised my school for me. So, this was in by 86. I had people coming from Alaska and from Arizona. And because it was a charming Victorian with three bedrooms, they would stay. And we would have these weekends and sometimes yeah, original would retreat. Yes, it was. It was really fun and wonderful. And there, there was a group in Seattle where there was a teacher over there and a, a yarn shop owner and they would come over. And I mean, it was a really fun thing for me. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I had also started working at the local yarn shop, my beloved Dinah and her wonderful local yarn shop one day a week. And I got to have the bond there so that I could sell the bonds and then I could also help people. And I, I, so one day a week I was helping people, they would come in and while I was doing the machine knitting now, when in 1985, roughly no handwritten patterns had schematics, but I, none, they were just these long columns of symbols and words. However, the machine world did things with schematics because you are going so fast, you can't stop and read every single line. All you are doing is making this chunk of fabric. There, that's a sweater back. And you need to know how many rows, how many stitches. And so that became, I thought, why can't we do this with hand knit sweaters? This makes sense. And meanwhile, at the yarn shop, people were coming in with problems with sweaters. People were making a lot of sweaters back then. They couldn't, quote unquote, get the gauge. And so they, I would say, okay, go home, make a, a good size gauge swatch. It had to be at least six inches wide and, you know, at least four to six inches tall and bring it back. I showed them how to measure it. And then... I drew little pictures for them as to how many stitches to cast on. And I did that because that's how partly how my brain works, that I'm a visual. uh, I I also, I mean, we all have, we all combine, like I'm auditory and visual and other, but I have a real strong preference for visual rather than reading, which with a master's in English, you would think, but I don't like to read knitting patterns so much. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it was, I mean, I can, but they were not that much fun. And especially, 
I was another thing I did in this, <clears throat> like in the early eighties, was I was a freelance book editor. So it's it's almost impossible not to make mistakes every time you go back. And that was back in the days where you know we cut and paste with scissors and tape. Right. So every time you had to make a correction, the guy who did the linotype would make another mistake and you'd have to fix it. So there were so many errors and patterns that by making it visual, you bypass those. Right, right. It you can't lie can. with the 12 inches wide. So on the next line. So let's see. So then people really liked that. And they said, you know what? You should teach a class in that. So I made a class in that at my little knitting school, which I didn't do a whole lot of, you know, mostly I just worked a few days, a couple days a week. And we had cows and a kid that ran all over the place. And, you know, and, and I, we eventually homeschooled him and alternatively schooled him. So it was pretty family intense. <clears throat> so I taught the class. And so that's a, if you're going to write a book, this is anybody who wants to write a book, I'm going to make this recommendation. If you want it to be something that's a technique book that's lasting and that is really becomes a classic, make sure that you teach it in person first. Several times. Multiple times. Yes. <laughs> because what that will do is it will tell you the questions that people need to have answered it will they will guide you to all the holes that you've missed because you have all this information in your head and it's very difficult to translate that into beginner's mind mm -hmm. so okay so i was doing all these videos or all these um classes on the machine and all these people somebody said actually it was my ex-husband's husband or cousin who was a video producer for a television program uh, um, station in San Francisco when he was up. And he said, you know, what you do is really videographic. You should make videos of this. And I went, well, that's a good idea <laughs> because I had studied radio and television production at the university of Michigan in 66, 67. And there were like two classes total um back in those days that was not a very popular thing but speech is my minor speech and performance is my minor so that was, was interesting to me so I knew how to do it I knew how to storyboard so I hired a professional producer paid this was 1987 I paid him ten thousand dollars my husband had um, inherited that. I did not have the $10,000, but we were investing in ourselves. We each took $10,000 to make a business after the stock market dumped in October of 87. And we shot and he came over once. I went over to visit him once. They knew nothing about machine knitting. So every single shot where their camera was supposed to be, I drew a little sketch of with the script next to it. And we shot over, th I think it's over three hours. Yeah, well over three hours of finished program in one day. Wow. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I don't even know. I, I mean, I certainly couldn't do that now. But I was so, first of all, I was very familiar with it because I taught it so many times in person. And so you, that's- You were focused. Yes, and I scripted it and read it into a cassette player. And everywhere I went, I would play that script so that I could learn it. That's how that one worked for me. And um, that was back in the days where there was it was linear editing. It was not nonlinear. Well, nowadays you can take a chunk from here and stick it over there. This had to be edited right from the beginning all the way through. They edited a lot of it <laughs> in the the anteroom to the one of the bedrooms and it was like he edited in situ in the tape as it went along because it was a two camera shoot um and so then i had those made into cassettes and sold those around the united states at the time do you remember lee wards yes yes lee wards had like a hundred and some stores uh -huh. they were one of my first um 
dealers. Mm -hmm. So I would have drop shipped a hundred tapes of each program at a time. Then we made PAL masters and they were sold in throughout the UK and Canada. I went, we went up to Canada and talked to Bon Canada lady. So, so I, those now are up on YouTube. It's the oldest um, footage of knitting on YouTube. Then some some producers, the, uh, the same guys who produced, who were involved in the first production, came to me a couple of years later and said, hey, let's do a program together. Because they saw that I was selling all these videos. I didn't tell you this part. The producer tried to talk me out of doing the videos because he said, oh. Nobody no. would be interested. Yeah. Right. No. Oh, and, and there was this one woman who, I, who, was, my, who I was our stockbroker, which... She said, and when I mentioned it to her, when I took the ten thousand dollars out, you thought you were an idiot. Yeah. Well, what she said, no, it was worse. <laughs> it was, I can't think of anything more boring than watching <laughs> someone knit for an hour. Shall I say that she was not our stockbroker for long? <laughs> um, so I just thought, my goodness, that's something. Uh, <laughs> So these producer guys thought, oh, well, she's doing okay, so let's make another one. And that's how the um, finishing 101 got uh, got written. Because all those years, you know, Tuesday, every Tuesday for more or less eight years, and then another couple of years, not every Tuesday, um, the same problems came up every single time. And that is... How do you make this sweater fit? How do I sew it together so that it looks good? 90% of the problems were those, probably even 96%. So with Sweater 101, I addressed, this is how you make them fit. It's not a, desi it's not a fancy design book. It's not like Shirley Payton's beautiful knitwear you know, workshop. It's just understanding the principles You've got a body, take some measurements, you understand gauge, you can build anything to the right size. So that's, and then, and then I dropped out of the knitting world for a while. I, and in about the early nineties, maybe 94 or so, 95. And so I turned every, I turned the distribution of the tapes over to a different country company. And then, um, pattern works published sweater 101. The first time it, Linda Skolnick was brilliant in her approach to solving knitting problems and the things she created. I was very fortunate to have them. Um, <clears throat> and I dropped out for 10 years of the business because my family, my kid was now in junior high, needed a lot more direction for schooling, got more serious at that point. Until then, I let him play and lead the, the way. Um, and when I and then pattern works had been sold and I got word that they were going to let Sweater 101 go out of print because they didn't want to create any of their own products. They only wanted somebody else to print them and or right. make them. they were going to sell them. And so I said, well, you know, 15 years is a long run for any book. So I'm going to just let this go. But I instead I Googled it. It's the first time I ever Googled myself. And this was in the late 90s. Yeah, I can't re quite remember. No, the early 2000s. So if you did Cheryl Brunette, you got a lot of pornographic stuff like brunettes, blondes, and redheads, right? <laughs> so but I did find, <laughs> which I went, oh, no, nobody could ever find <laughs> this. And instead, I um, did Sweater 101. And a young woman who was a fairly new knitter had just blogged about it. And how it helped her make a sweater for her friend who was pregnant, a little vest for this baby. And I thought, and she just was really pleased with the book and, and thought it was useful. And I went, wait a second, people are still using this. And then I started poking around and there was all this knitting stuff on the Internet. Meanwhile, all these 10 years I was knitting personally, but I just wasn't in the business. And so I... Um, thought, okay, well, maybe I'll get the distribution rights back and do something with it. So I ended up 
publishing it again, an ebook in 2007, um, a hardbound. The hardbound is due to um, Elizabeth Zimmerman's daughter because she said, I, Meg is great. And she had always been promoting the book. And Meg, I sent her an e-copy and she said, oh, Cheryl, you know, I love this book and I've been promoting it for years. But I like to curl up in my knitting chair with a book. So I put it into print um, and it's been going almost, it'll be 30 years next year that the book has been pretty much continuously in print. Let me read so, real quick what Meg says on the back of your book. She said, okay. I had no idea your wonderful book was coming back. Hooray. Don't think I've given a workshop in the last 15 years without mentioning you and it. She's great. I mean, of course, Elizabeth Zimmerman was one of my favorite. I already knew how to knit really well before her books came out, but I read Knitting Without Tears. And what I loved about her was her sense of humor and sense of just, I mean, sometimes people take themselves very seriously <laughs> and, and she didn't. And highly expert and so innovative in her stuff. So um, and I met Meg in the year the book was published mm -hmm. in 1991. I went to Philadelphia and I was the commentator for the fashion show at Stitches that oh, year. What? That September. Because I had been going over with Dinah. I knew all the yarns really well back then in the yarn shop because I was there all the time, you know, once a week. And so I gave, I was the fashion show commentator in the Seattle trade oh, show for some, some years. Yeah. So, um, so that's about, that's about it. And then, so then I put my old videos up on YouTube and I thought, ah, you know, these are old. Nobody's going to really pay attention. Well, that wasn't true. <laughs> attention. And then I decided, I don't know how I decided to start making, um, newer videos for YouTube, except I had a very close friend, um, who had moved to the area and he was a retired Hollywood cameraman and director of photography. And he saw some of my old stuff. He said, Cheryl, you should be doing this. <laughs> and so he helped me set up a studio and um, I look better in those <laughs> than I ever have because, okay, you have Celeste Holmes key light and never get closer than Lucille Ball would let you get, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So I had some help. Um, to get started. He, he moved back to California some years ago because to be closer to family, because his health was getting more fragile. So, um, in all of this, what do you think is the most important thing? And this is a silly question, but what is the most important thing to have a successful outcome? And that is gauge. And you and I were talking about that before we went live today, about the history of the gauge swatch and how it came about and how did they decide four inches and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. And how, how desperately misunderstood it is, how, um, how I really think we need as an industry to change how we write patterns to Talk about gauge differently because, well, how it came to, I mean, I've always known that it was a problem and I always taught anybody who's been in a class with me personally understands gauge, makes a good size gauge swatch, can measure it, can cast a sweater with sweater 101. They can, you know, make what they need. But I, people are so resistant it's like a joke on the internet. That's what it is in these different knitting groups. Who does a gauge swatch? I never do a gauge swatch. So 10 years ago, I went to Mackinac City, Michigan to do a weekend retreat for Cynthia. And usually I just would teach like a sweater 101, but she wanted a product so that they would leave, you know, after they, they come on Friday evening and leave on Sunday afternoon. So she said, I want him to be able to leave with something. So this is like a current issue but I made this little this little guy sweater and it was a I made a I think it was about a size three or two and she had a particular yarn 
that went that she wanted. It was a knit two. What is that? Knit two crochet one. Anyway, it was a, a kind of long stripe color yarn. Um, and somebody made Fimo buttons. She had maybe five colorways of it, and everybody chose a kit that they wanted to make this little sweater out of by the color, and that was part of what they received the first night they got there. So the first night, the introduction, um, and this is your assignment for tomorrow morning. You go back to your room, and you need to make a gauge swatch this big, big one. And in the morning, we're going to have breakfast and then measure those. So 25 women, one of whom was new, the other 24 were very highly skilled and very, very experienced, like 20, 30 years. Beautiful lace, beautiful um, cable, you know, just wonderful work, exquisite handwork. Every single one of them brought something that didn't fit them. That we went over on Saturday night. That was what our Saturday night was. But the next way, you know, I measured them. I gave them there and I told them how to um, fill in their pattern. And so at the end of the first day, we just started knitting. By the end of the first day, they were supposed to have finished the, the back by that night. Um, and the next morning... Three women who had roomed together for years, lived close together, they all had different gauges, and they were, even though highly experienced, totally astonished that all their backs came out the same size. It's, it's not rocket science. It's like tiling a floor. Yeah. If, if you have a kitchen floor, you measure the size of the floor, you measure the size of the tiles. You buy enough tile to cover the floor. Bada bing, bada bang, you're done. Stitches are the same way. They're just these little building blocks, and you just need to know how many of them you have. So this truly, there were two knitting teachers there, all these experienced people, and same yarn, different colors, but... Um, all experienced, I think that they had a choice of their needle size. Like it was a worsted weight. It was a super wash worsted weight. So most people, you know, six, seven, or eight, according to what you liked. We had, with that many experienced knitters, 13 different gauges. And that got me thinking, I thought, you know, and if I hadn't had that large group, to do that, I never would have thought to like look at it more closely. So now my the classes that I have taught more recently that are local, that are just 10 people at a time, Sweater 101, I started to check to compare people. I wrote down everybody's gauge as we took it because that was they had to come to class with a swatch. And I started to see a pattern. So two years ago, I arbitrarily went to the internet and I chose 20 patterns, some by famous knitters, some by novice knitters, all worsted weight. Um, I sort of, I was looking for the like anonymous, you know, the non um, brand, like, and just any worsted weight. Cascade 220 was probably the one I saw most often. And I wrote down, all, what all the gauges I you can look up the pattern even if it's a, a pattern that you'd have to pay for usually you get the gauge without um right. having I like on Ravelry and I only took 20 I said I want to look at this and so when I had the 20 and I'm not a statistician so my math could be a little bit off on this but I, but it, it certainly is enough to hit you over the head with a two by four out of the 20, these are all the, the gauges that I got. And the ones that are yellow, that means that I got the, those were the same gauge recommendations twice. These are 13 different gauges out of 20. But the important thing is, maybe it's not quite 13, it's 13 different shapes of the stitch. And when I 
worked on the ratios and printed them out, the shapes looked like this. Everything from this, because we all know they're a rectangle, right? right. That was another thing. Almost nobody knew. So that, yeah. from there to yeah. there. Wow. Yes, huge difference. 20 patterns. So out of that, I figured that you had, if you just randomly picked a pattern out of worsted, they would say, okay, um, you have a one, you have a 6.25%. It's actually 16 different shapes, I guess. One sixteenth of a chance to hit the gauge that the author did. So what do we tell people? We tell them, this is the gauge that you have to get. If you don't, go to a bigger needle size or a little needle, little needle size until you get the gauge. You could knit until you're blue in the face with every needle in your arsenal and still not get that gauge. That, I have seen so many people think that their knitting is wrong. I mean, as a teacher, our goal is not to frustrate people. It's to facilitate their success. Exactly. And we are not facilitating success by telling people they have to get that same gauge. Right. And the thing is, every pattern, the person writing the pattern gives you their gauge. And each person's gauge is different. No two are going to be exactly the same. So they're expecting you as the knitter to change to this person's gauge, this person's gauge, this person's gauge. When you knit the way you knit, you don't knit the way they knit. I you know? know. And that ratio of the height to the width, that really delivers for me. You know, that, that makes it, that's like, oh, wow, of course. I mean, I could see different stitch gauges. Usually, now, my experience is that usually people can come up with the right stitch gauge. Mm -hmm. And then, and that's what I recommend, actually, is get the right stitch gauge and then use your row gauge to adjust the length. You know, you might have to use a little bit. Of stuff. Yes. But all of this math, it's not algebra. It's if you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you can figure this out, especially if you have a picture. And that will show you. So I last summer, um, before I uh, was rudely interrupted by um, a heart attack and emergency open heart surgery, but I am glad that <laughs> I, the outcome was just fine. Thank you very much. Um, I was doing research on 200 sweater patterns and I'm tracking who the designers were because I wanted to see well from one sweater to another do the designers and I chose people that I you know that are really like I think Jared Flood's patterns are so well written technically um, and so this is actually the data from 200 patterns I, that, I got that far I haven't finished that whole project yet and so it goes from a ratio of 0.57 to 0.88, and these ones didn't have any row gauge. So I, I don't know how we need to rewrite patterns. I, I mean, certainly just teach people, uh, take a class about gauge. That's really a class that, that helps you get the connection. <clears throat> and I have it. every student who didn't get the connection, if they're in a live class with me, there's ever at some point somebody's going to go, oh, geez, that's so simple. So that's kind of what I want to. I I'm not sure. I'm going to go forward. I have the energy now and am healed enough to go forward with this project. And I'm not sure the format that I'm going to use if it's going to be an online class. But I really, if I have one thing left to contribute, that would really, I think help people, that's it. That is, you know, and, and that probably is where even experience, like you said, the people with the experience were flabbergasted that after you figured out their stitch gauge and their schematic, that their sizes came out correctly, even though they were using different, you know, things. And I went, I teach a, a class here locally, and I've, I've taught it for a lot of years. And um, I give everybody, they have to have the exact same needles, the same brand, the same size, 
and the same yarn. And I teach them how to knit. And then we measure the gauge in stockinette, garter stitch, um, um, seed stitch, and a cable and lace. And I put it up on the blackboard. I say, how many stitches to the inch did you get? And I put everybody's down and they're all different. And they're all using the same needle and the same yarn. The only difference is the knitter. And it just shows that it's a personal thing. You, it's, it's almost, and that's why your book is so good, is because when you learn that you just need your fabric and you need your schematic and you make your fabric fit your schematic, it doesn't matter. Your gauge is not so important at that point. It's just a matter that you have the right number of stitches to make it reach the widths you want and the number of rows you need to make it reach the height you want. That's all there is to it. And some shaping, you know? Yeah, I, I like to frame, frame it as knitting is your tool. It's not your master. And, um, and you brought up something that's really important and that irritates the heck out of me. And that's one of the reasons I chose Jared Flood, because he does a very good job on this, that there are so many patterns that will have you make, a, let's say a cardigan. Cardigans are the perfect example. So you have a cardigan and they knit the band as you go along. And if it's a garter stitch, what happens is the band sucks up and it's too short. And so you tug and you can pull it down. And this business of blocking it out, I don't believe in that. Worse than that, and I've seen it for years and years, is a vertical rib. And, you know, people, people go, oh, my belly's so big. That's why my cardigan is gapping down at the bottom. That's not why it's gapping. The reason it's gapping is your band is longer than the body of your sweater, and it has to go somewhere, so it curves out. So it's really important to understand gauge so that you have the power to use different stitches in one piece of knitting and have them work out. So let's take um, a garter stitch edge. How would you compensate for that? You would add short rows in the band, which is, and I actually calculated it according to like, you can see when you look at this, there's a wide range, but most everybody falls in about the same center between 66% and 73 or 4% is where most people fall for stock in it sit. So if you take that and then the regular, like one by two for garter stitch, 50%, then you can, if you do, you have to do a pair of short rows, like every six, row or every seventh I row. I do one an inch, one short row an inch. So if you're using worsted weight yarn, that's going to be about seven rows. Perfect. Okay. So a short row, which is two, two rows. What I add a garter at Ridge every yes. inch and it works out absolutely perfect. It's not right. too long, think... not too short. Yes. That's a perfect confirmation. And for the long ribbing, you have to, I, I was, I didn't really figure this out all the way, but it was closer to like the tw every 20th row that you yeah. add a pair of short rows yeah. on the body side. Right. You have to skip the, the ribbing. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, well, thank you. That makes me like, because uh, I get nervous. Because if you want to turn an industry on its head by saying, this is not the way we should be delivering patterns to people, the, especially, I mean, even, even people who are experienced. So then... Uh, just <laughs> because I knew I was having bad symptoms, but I, you know, I wanted to, um, you start a really big project and then you can't get sick. So last summer I started, I had put out a survey and I've already had, I haven't checked it recently, but uh, over 550, 560 people have answered it. And it's all about their experiences with Gage. And there are wonderful answers. It's really giving me some input because I'm trying to figure out, again, I'm trying to figure out how to, in a big way, facilitate people understanding this, especially if you're going to make sweaters. Um, and 
I found out, wait, I have, I found these figures today. What percentage? So you had to say, like, how often do you make a gauge swatch? And fifth, fully 50% was 10% was never. 20% was um, <laughs> once in a while or something like that. And then 20% was um, about, ha yes, about half the time. So fully 50% of people do not make a gauge swatch half of the time. The one, the other half who the people who do make gauge swatches, they get it. So, so let's, let's just, I made this last night and it's because I just got enough yarn for four sweaters. <laughs> this is another thing. This is how I'm protecting my family from getting sick. Everybody gets an Icelandic sweater and I have to stay alive long enough to knit them. They have to stay alive long enough to um, wear them. I know that's not true, but anyway, <laughs> it's making me comfortable. So I sat down and while I was watching the news made this last night and it's six by six. Um, and that it's interesting because both my son and his sweetie girlfriend um want cardigans and my son were adapting a, a pullover it's ice they're icelandic sweaters and they were kits sort of from iceland the yarn is of course beautiful it's a little bit scratchy and i haven't blocked this yet obviously which i will do by putting it in warm water i want to see if it blooms um and but i just so my son's this is how I want to do it. I want to, I did this back and forth. If you're going to make a sweater in the round, you should make your swatch in the round. You should do a fast swatch. But I said, no, I want to make the bottom part of the sweater back and forth. And then when I get to the yoke where all the stranding is, then I'm going to switch to circular. But I have to come up with some sort of edging that I'm going to be able, because I have to steek this part. Right. I, so I want to be able to steek that in a way that then becomes compatible with the rest of the front of the sweater. So that's, and this gave me an up, and I thought, well, I could put two garter stitches at the edge. But you can see even, I thought, well, two are not, they're not going to make much of a difference in shape. But even two garter stitches starts to cause it to bow. Right. In this short a distance yeah. so um and look this gives so watching news one hour plus another 10 minutes that's all it takes to make so much yeah uh, but i think so people are so resistant to it and i see it i still see it on like facebook knitting groups all the time yes and i think they're resistant not because of the hour or two maybe that it takes that can save you a hundred hours but instead it's the confusion and we tend to back away from things we don't understand and are confused right. about right what i tell people is because i'm an addicted knitter like i'm an addicted reader also when i finish one book i start another book immediately um i can't have that pause and knitting is the same way. When I finish one project, I need to be ready to start the next project. And that does not include a gauge swatch because I want to dive into the project. But what I do do as I'm knitting the current project, I make my gauge swatch for the next project. So I have it all set and it's been sitting there. It's resting. I carry it around, you know, and so it's ready to get a good, accurate measurement. Also, on your swatch there, because you have the little garter edges, I don't want people to think to put garter edges on their swatches because it will distort. Yes, a yes. swatch should just be stockinette or whatever the stitch pattern is that you're going to be working with. Right. Most I was, edges. I was testing that as an edge. Right. Just, and and I, I don't think it's going to work because I, I would have to then add a cup. I, I mean, I haven't thought it all the way through because I have two Afghans in the work. But I have I have multiple projects that I have going, but I also can't let it get more than, let's say, three or four. I always have one like I have I just delivered a whole basket of um, slippers 
to my son's place to the old Victorian because the you know the ceilings are ten feet. It, it's not well insulated. Um, it's a shoeless house. And it was supposed to be their Christmas gift, but I couldn't knit there for a while. And so I delivered a whole basket of different sizes. And now I'm starting all over again so that I always have something that I can pick up that does. This is my mother's recipe. I call it. I don't have to think about how many I, you know, I don't have to read the pattern. I don't, I just cast on different number of stitches and just do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that kind of knitting. And then I have two, two part, you know, Afghans that are, this you know squares that big that are going but now I'm starting sweaters so it depends on what kind of mood I'm in or if I'm watching something or you know how fo how focused I have to be I so guess. person asked a question here Luann Wright she said I asked a designer once if they add the amount of yarn for a swatch in their yarn amount so how do you buy enough yarn <laughs> I always buy more than you think you will need because then you can make afghans and other things out of it. But my mother's rule for a sweater, and we went to Lee Ward's at their big sales once a year, and she had a Buick, and so she, we filled the trunk. <laughs> the same year. And 69 cents a, a skein for really nice worsted wool, and she, it was four ounces back then. So she always said that 24 ounces was enough to make a sweater for us me you know medium size sweater and then but there were always bits and pieces left so every year every grandkid had to do a hand to get mittens because michigan snow hand, growing hands hats we just i just would rather have extra wool around than not and i it's fun Please to play buy with. an extra skein or an extra ball because right. I might need to swatch in the middle of the sweater, too. I might need to try out something different to see if it's going to work. And I try it on my swatch rather than on my sweater. Yes. And oftentimes, like, maybe I don't want to put the buttonholes in that the designer put in. Maybe I want to use a different buttonhole. So I need to see how's this buttonhole going to work with the buttons that I'm going to use and stuff like that. So having an extra skein, um, it's way better than not having enough yarn. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have the temperament to play yarn chicken. <laughs> so uh, somebody else asked up here earlier, and it was a really good question. I, I'm sorry that I don't remember who asked it, but they said they're from uh, Europe. Is DK waste yarn in Europe the same as worsted weight yarn in the U.S.? Is That's a very good question. DK is slightly... Well, of course, different yarn manufacturers are different, but DK is is lightweight. Aran is heavier weight. I think they are what um, eight ply and ten ply, and worsted is kind of right in the middle of that in general. Mm -hmm. But let's say you get um, a a superwash worsted is skinnier than a regular non super worst yeah so and and really i do wool i was raised just outside of detroit um i live in a climate where you can see what i'm wearing in july <laughs> it's been in the 60s almost every day this week um so where i live wool is the practical thing to do i love wool and i live like it's 107 where i live today but uh, like these are wool socks, you know, I, I still knit with wool. Uh, if I just use lighter weight, like fingering weight, I make my sweaters here in fingering weight yarn and wool is very versatile. It's very breathable. It wicks moisture away from your body, you know? Um, so I don't have any problem with wool, even though I live in a really warm climate and I'm a prolific sweater knitter. I have lots and lots of sweaters. Let me see. Now, if any of you have questions when you over in the chat there, be sure to put the word question in all caps so I can see it real easy. And I'll ask them of Cheryl if you have any questions. So carry on. I interrupted you there. No, I think I really do think that that is what I have to say. And if anyone has any ideas of um how they would like to receive the information or get the information about Gage, 
um, let me know. And one idea was that it could be like I was going to expand on Sweater 101. It was going to be Sweater 201. And the expansion was all the things that I've learned really since then so that I would put more specific shaping into it for waists or I would do um, a, a sleeve cap. And this would be a combined – this would strictly be – not printed, but electronic, so that you could have videos in to show. this. The technology does not cost $10,000 for one day anymore. Um, so it's easier to create a different kind of multi-faceted um, experience for right. people. So you can hit. You can hit exactly. more ways of getting information to people. Exactly, exactly. So uh, back to the gauge, you know, why, you know, I've, I have never read anything in particular on this, but I just surmise that gauge is given over four inches because it's 10 centimeters in Europe and it was just a convenient number. It's not because you're supposed to knit your gauge swatch to be four by four or 10 by 10 centimeters. Um, right. And so people misinterpret that. They think that if you're supposed to get, you know, 20 stitches over four inches, that means you knit a swatch 20 stitches wide. And first of all, you have those two salvage stitches on each edge, which are not going to give you a full stitch width. So if you right. measure, if you cast on 20 stitches and knit your four inch swatch, and then you measure the width of it and you use that as your gauge, you're off right there. And just right. being off, let's say you knit a sweater that's 40 inches in circumference. If you're off by half a stitch an inch, your sweater is going to be five inches too big or five inches too little. I, I came across those. I, my son, when I make a sweater for my son, it's usually 42 inches measurement on the sweater itself. And I happened to see these figures as I was going through old notes. And so the pattern calls for 4.5 stitches per inch, which is what this pattern does call for, by the way. And I, just my preliminary measurement is it's 4.7. That's the other thing. Don't round it off. Do not do that. Um, if it's under, I forget the number that I sort of arbitrarily chose, but I think if it's um, five, if it's under a certain, if it's five and under, you should uh, go to the hundredth of a stitch. And if it's over that, then you can go to a tenth of a stitch. But if it, if, for example, it's 4.5 and I, to, that's to get 42 inches and it's actually 42 and a quarter inches. But if it's 4.75, it's going to take it down to 40 inches. Well, that's no ease then for my son. He likes the type, but it's not net. Right. Not next week. And if it's four and a quarter stitches instead of four and a half, you're going to get almost 45 inches. I mean, that's a quarter of a stitch. Right. Exactly. And it's a huge difference. So there's some questions here. Okay. Um, Cat Gore. Oh, let me see. Let me start up. The, when I said questions, boy, did they come up with them. <laughs> I'm going to put them on the screen here. So Adam Lopez said, Hi, Adam. <laughs> Let me move me out of the way. I'm going to take me out of here. Adam said, any new books planned on the future? And you talked about that. Maybe the Knitting 201, Sweater 201, yeah. or something on Gage. Yeah. And then um, Kim Seacrest said, book availability. So your current book, the Sweater 101, how is it available? It is available. You go to sweater101.com and I will give your viewers a tip. I am not going to reprint. It's an ebook now, but because it is a, um, a pretty heavy duty hardcover and it's printed in Korea and um, I love the binding and everything else, but I have to have a very large order when you're doing linotype stuff like this and not digital printing. So I, I don't want to print thousands and I'm down to about 400 at your house. Yeah. Okay. So people order from you directly. They will yes. get one because on yeah. Amazon they're used and they're like a hundred dollars. Oh, that's the other thing. I mean, they're going to be more expensive. I will, when I get rid of those 400 books, I, it's actually less than that now. Um, I, I'll look for a print on demand, but 
uh, you won't get this binding. I'm going to look for a spiral binding, but it'll probably be more expensive because you're doing one off, you know, and I, I'm just done schlepping the books. They're right. just, right. they're big boxes and they're. People want, if you did something that was printable, they could go down to Kinko's and have it bound, you know, or any uh, right. office supply place and have it bound. It costs like 10 bucks, you know. Okay, so Billy E said, <laughs> this is a good question. I like this one. Can we see Cheryl's knitting style? She must be quick to knit that swatch in one hour. No, I'm actually not that fast. Um, I, you, If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll it's, be able yes, to see it. Exactly. In a lot of videos on how you knit. Right, but I throw which is much slower than Continental. And I have no desire actually to speed knit. I don't understand that. I, because, um, and especially now my hands aren't quite as nimble as they were. <laughs> so, and my mother, my mother was the one, she knit me a sweater in one day to go to a dance when I was in high school. But it was the same pattern that we always used and it was, uh, and the, it didn't have the buttons on it. Yeah. <laughs> This is Thea Stewart, and this is a great question. Is all this gauge talk just for sweaters or for all items? I follow the recommended gauge on the pattern and then make a swatch. Am I doing this wrong? Oh, well, first of all, get rid of that idea that you're doing it wrong. You're doing it how you're doing it, okay? Um, now, that depends on you. If you're making a shawl, for example, and it has a certain size, um, and you miss the gauge by a whole bunch, it might end up so that it's dragging on the floor. I mean, there, I guess there are limits to what you can do, but in general, I do not worry about the size of the gauge for blankets. Like, did you see this is my old Harrisville tweed that I've had for 35 years that was on um, cones. I had to wash it because it still had the grease in it. And I finally used it up over the last two winters to make this huge afghan. I love it. It's wool. Um, so, oh, geez, I just talked myself right out of an idea. Where it was, was I? Uh, doing the gauge swatch just for sweaters. I want the fabric that I want. Uh, for sweaters, you have to have all the numbers. But the f for this, for example, this is... Um, a, a kind of a fuzzy wool. I used it doubled and it's garter stitch. Well, gar you know, if you make garter stitch too loose, it grows and it grows and it grows. So I made, I knew this was going to be a large afghan and I wanted it to hold its shape really well. So when the fabric felt right, that's the gauge that I use. That's just right. the size. Um, what else? Uh, scarves and stuff. You know, you don't you don't want it hanging. Just come up with a fabric that you like right. and use. It. Try and and I have people start with a certain number of stitches and then work several inches with one needle, then then make a garter ridge several inches with another needle garter ridge several inches and then block the whole thing and then feel it. Which fabric do you like? Which one's the one that makes you happy? You know, and yeah. that's that's the gauge you need to use. And if it's like a, a nice shawl, it needs to be drapey and not stiff. But if it's, you know, other, I don't know what you'd want stiff. But anyway. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, well, never mind. It's a different topic. But uh, <laughs> this is J.L. Morgan says, is it wise to use your swatch yarn in your project? That's an interesting question. I, I don't. I keep my swatches. For one thing, when you get a hole in the sweater, because I have sweaters, you know, that are 35 years old, that I, I don't make a whole lot of sweaters for myself because I don't like having a whole lot of clothes to manage. And I already have an absolute killer sweater. You know, I made, I was in the K facet thing and made a Jack's back and, you know, the feathers jacket and all that sort of stuff. But to have this around... I use it as a reference going forward. And if you do choose to use it, though, let's say you run out of yarn and you need to use it, not only do you have to unravel it, but you have to reclaim it by putting it in warm water. You have to skein it up, wash it, and not wash it, wash it, but let it soak with vinegar, if it's wool, vinegar and um, water, and then hang it with a little bit of weight. Yeah. 
I don't like hang it so that it makes a crease in the top. I put it over something that's wide and pull it down and um, two things down here to kind of spread it out. Unkink it. Unkink it. Otherwise, it's going to look wonky yep. when you knit it up. Okay, this is a good question from Margaret Bramell. She says, can you speak about row gauge and shaping when adjusting for your own row gauge? So adjusting the length during the shaping. Yeah. So if you have a schematic, it will tell you that here's where the underarm starts and you're going to knit down. Let me just feel for a second here. Well, let's maybe let's eight eight inches, let's say, that it goes down to your waist, that you need to do that shaping. So you take your own row gauge, so you know the number of rows to go all the way down to your waist is narrow, and you evenly space those decreases along those eight inches. And probably the last, I would put the last decrease at the um, at, at your waist. And I, you can use the more or less right formula. That's what I would do, which is from Sweater 101. Um, or you can, you know, if you don't have the book, you can just go, okay, I have eight inches. I need to make six um, decreases. So eight over six, that's one and a quarter. Every quarter inch and a quarter, I'm going to do that. You can do it that way too. And it doesn't have to be exactly evenly distributed. It could be like every six rows and eight rows and six rows and it could, so that you're not making them on the wrong side of the fabric. Or you could well, make them on the wrong side of the fabric if you wanted to. Right. But and don't make them at right the very edge of the fabric. Right. I, exactly. At least an inch so that you, when you put in your seam, it's not going to be all, right. you know, wonky. So Kathy Trykowska wants to know, is Cheryl coming to us from her studio? She is. She is. She loves her studio and is so grateful for it. <laughs> uh, let's see. I live in a place that's less than 350 square feet. So there is no, that is by choice. There is no room for all the yarns and all of that stuff other than in the studio. So let's, here's another question. Julie Horner, do you have an online gauge class? I would love to learn the best way to find a gauge. I don't, and that might be the next thing in the works. Because it I would fit very well with your plans. I, I think it would, and I, I'm, um, I had been getting, um, less and less energy over probably the last five or six years. And um, now I'm feeling more energy again, but I'm also going to be 73 next month. And so I'm kind of figuring I, I'm going to be hanging up my, my professional knitting needles sometime in the, maybe in the next couple of years at least. And so I want to give the best, um, contribution that I can during that time and that was the one that's the one I've been kind of toying with if I did sort of an evergreen class engage that might because I can figure that out because I taught like in public and department of defense schools for 11 years and I never ever used anyone else's curriculum I developed all my own classes and wrote all my own curricula. So um, I kind of like that process because it, it's challenging and, and you try to do it. Right. You know. It's the same way like when, because I do a lot of my teaching uh, on my YouTube videos. And yes. to be quite honest with you, I don't go and watch everyone else's YouTube videos before I make my YouTube videos because I want it to be my my interpretation of the issue, you know. And, and I have done all the research in the books, and I have knitted it myself, and I have taught it to a lot of people already and seen their questions and where they have issues. And so when I teach it on YouTube, I bring all of that. I don't want to be influenced by other YouTubers. And like we were talking about before we started the live, is there's it's just like doctors who go to medical school, you know, who do you, what do you call the person who graduated at the bottom of their class? Doctor. It's the same thing with um, pattern writers and YouTubers. There's YouTubers on knitting and there's YouTubers on knitting. There's pattern writers and there's pattern writers. 
there and because of Ravelry, which is wonderful, 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 but it has also enabled so many people to jump in to who think they are pattern writers. Yeah, that it's a double edged sword. Uh, we talk, yeah, we did talk about this that when I made my first videos, video was not accessible to people. I mean, there was a whole room filled with all the editing equipment and everything, plus two big cameras and lights and camera and action. And it was very expensive in $88. Now people can do it with their telephone. So the, that barrier has been removed. So the good part of that is really talented people have access to it who would not otherwise have access. The right. flip side is that you can learn um, something this morning from even another YouTube and then demonstrate it this afternoon. But as Su Suzanne and I were saying, you know, you can demonstrate something, but you don't bring context to it. And that's what she and I can do because we have so much experience behind it. And that I and I don't want to do anything that anybody else is doing on YouTube either, because that's not um, that's I mean, why duplicate it? Right. <laughs> I, I want to show, shall I shall I show people my the hole in that sweater? Yes. Yes. OK. So my son went to his brothers for Christmas and it's actually a stepbrother, but we don't uh, no his half brother. But we don't say that my stepson's. But I don't say that either. I call him my son from another mother. And um, they had gotten a new puppy. It was down in California. And this is a sweater that I made many years ago, oh, probably 30 years ago more, for my brother. And my or brother said it was too warm. Yeah, it's a it's a cowichan. Yes. And um, so he wanted a, a vest. So he gave, I said, well, if you're not going to use that, then give it back to me. And so he did. And I gave it to my son and my son has worn the heck out of it. Well, this is what the new puppy did. <gasps> oh. So that yarn isn't available anymore. And I, but I did get something. I did have some of the beige from my brother's or the white, the off white natural from my brother's sweater. And I did find, um, the same company from the same era, but it's not the five ply. It's this one. And so it's going to be slightly different color that I do want to like this. This is something I want to make a video of because I have looked every which way as I mean, there are multiple ways you can approach this. So this is the kind of thing I want to do and I have to do it soon. <laughs> I've been avoiding it um, because it's going to be, a lot of work and I'm not sure it'll come out, but that's the whole point to point out that when you fix a problem with a sweater or a hole, you have every single step of the way is a problem, you know, okay, now what am I going to do, going to do here? So that's the kind of stuff I do want to do. And there probably aren't that many people who are going to make videos of something like this. So, well, I'm going to watch that video. Let me tell you. <laughs> Like, well, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but at least yeah. he'll be okay with it. He was, yeah. I, I will say that my son was devastated. He was just His sick the day before Christmas. And so I said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I can do that, which I can, but, you know, I was just trying to make him feel good. Well, I'm going to cut this off here. We've been on here for an hour and 18 minutes. And wow. I think people have really, really enjoyed this. And I want to thank you so much for being my guest. It has been very, very delightful. Um, so. Thank you. It's yeah. been my pleasure. Yes. Maybe, maybe uh, as you get your gauge thing going, then maybe after that we could have you back. Okay. That, that would be, be fun, fun, wouldn't it? We can discuss yes. it more because that's that's I like gauge too. I'm big into gauge. There was one more question on here, but I think we answered it. And somebody said, well, there was a bunch more questions, but I'm cutting them off. But about the gauge swatch not having an edging, you don't need an edging on your gauge swatch. No, you don't. The, well, you don't. In this particular case, I was trying out. She was experimenting um, on the yeah, edge I, to see what right. kind of salvage she wanted to have on the front of the sweater. So. 
And it's wide enough that I'm not concerned that it's going to affect my stockinet gauge because I'll just measure the the center four inches or so. Exactly. It's like if you're doing a swatch that's four inches by four inches and you put garter stitch edging on it, that's going to distort your your measurements. So. Right. But thank you so much, Cheryl. It has thank been a delight. You. It has been a real delight. And I hope I hope we stay connected. I think we will. Yeah. Yeah, even on Facebook. Facebook is good. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'm going to let you go. We're going to finish the video. Goodbye, everybody. Happy knitting. Bye, everybody.